here we are. We're going to start the book of Timothy tonight. We remember who Timothy is. Father was a Greek, mother was a Jew, got his Christian faith from his mother, who was a believer, was circumcised at about 16 before Paul took him on the road with him to preach the gospel, to please the Jewish part of the church. Uh, and he is out with Paul, or he's ministering to Paul. Paul is in chains in Rome. Timothy is going back and forth to the churches to keep an eye on them for Paul. These are the churches that Paul planted, okay? So um, this is written by Paul, and it is the first uh, chapter of First Timothy. So here we go. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the command of God, our Savior, and Christ Jesus, our hope, to Timothy, my true son in the faith. So this is a letter specifically to Timothy. Grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus, our Lord. As I urged you when I went into Macedonia, stay there in Ephesus so that you may command certain people not to teach false doctrines any longer. He may be talking about the Judaizers that are encouraging all these Gentiles that they're not saved unless they get circumcised. And we remember that Paul said, I wish they'd take circumcision to the limit and castrate themselves. Why not? Okay, he was very angry because they were trying to come in and ruin the, the church of the Gentiles. So here we go. Uh, as I urged you when I went into Macedonia, stay there in Ephesus so that you may command certain people not to teach false doctrines any longer or to devote themselves to myths and endless genealogies. Such things promote controversial speculations rather than advancing God's work, which is by faith. The goal of this command is love, which comes from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. Some have departed from these and have turned to meaningless talk. They want to be teachers of the law, which is the Ten Commandments, but they don't know what they're talking about or what they so confidently affirm. We know that the law is good if one uses it properly. We also know the law is made not for the righteous, but for lawbreakers and rebels. Now, who are the righteous? The ones in right relationship with God. That would be us, okay? So it's, the law isn't for us. Jesus fulfilled it for us. We've, that price has been paid by our master for us, okay? So we're not under the law anymore. The law is for lawbreakers and rebels, the ungodly and sinful, the unholy and irreligious, for those who kill their fathers or mothers, for murderers, for the sexually immoral. Got to throw that in there because that's terribly important. What you do with your body for those practicing homosexuality, for slave traders and liars and perjurers. Okay, right there to those who say, oh, the Bible's all about slavery. Well, obviously the Bible doesn't agree with slavery when Paul is saying right here, the law is for slave traders and liars and perjurers and for whatever else is contrary to the sound doctrine that confirmed, conforms to the gospel concerning the glory of the blessed God, which he entrusted to me. Okay, so those are the people that are under the law. They're going to be judged by it unless they find the grace of Jesus Christ and invite him into, uh, invite his sacrifice, uh, or excuse me, receive his sacrifice by inviting him into their lives to be conformed into his image. If not, the law is going to eat them for lunch. When they stand in front of God, they're going to try to say, I was a good person. And God's going to say, but that's not how you win heaven. You win heaven by believing in me. You don't win heaven by being a good person. Okay, doesn't work like that. Good person is tied to the law. And we've all, we know we've all broken the law. Uh, I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who's given me strength that he considered me trustworthy, appointing me to his service. Even though I was once a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent man, I was shown mercy because I acted in ignorance and unbelief. The grace of our Lord was poured out on me abundantly along with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the worst, but for that very reason I was shown mercy so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his immense patience as an example for those who would believe in him and receive eternal life. So he's saying, if I can be saved, you can be saved, no matter what your sin is, okay? 
Now, to the King Eternal, Immortal, Invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Timothy, my son, not his literal son, okay, but in the faith, I'm giving you this command in keeping with the prophecies once made about you, so that by recalling them, you may fight the battle well. Okay, so when, when people give us prophecies and those prophecies are confirmed, we hang on to them. Okay, so if someone, if someone prophesied over me 30 years ago, the Lord will bring those who are to support you in your ministry. And then 15 years later, the exact same thing was spoken over me again as a confirmation. I hang on to that. I say the Lord is going to supply the people who are going to support my ministry, who are going to help me in my ministry. Okay, so he's saying, um, Timothy, my son, I'm giving you this command in keeping with the prophecies once made about you so that by recalling them, you may fight the battle well, holding on to faith and a good conscience, which some have rejected and so have suffered shipwreck with regard to the faith. Among them are Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I've handed over to Satan to be taught not to blaspheme. Okay, so for me, when I get, not even when I get down, but let's say I'm sitting here going, Lord, you know, do you have more for me? Or what would you have me do? I remember the prophecies, okay? I also remember the prophecy that was given to me on the day that I was delivered of 39 spirits in a basement of a Methodist church by an English team, an English gentleman and his daughter and his partner, Leo, and uh, in front of 30 or 40 people. Okay, there was a prophecy given and I hang on to those words. And I remember recently before I, uh, before certain things unfolded for me in the last week, I remember before last week sitting there and saying, Lord, you gave me these prophecies. Where are they? Okay, and that's okay to ask that, to hold God to his word and say, look, I know that if you said something, I know that it's supposed to come true. Where is it? Okay, and um uh, what was I going to say about it? Oh, well, okay. Um, among them are, we read that. Okay, so 1 Timothy chapter 2. I urge then for, oh, this is what I wanted to say. I heard someone on YouTube, a black girl once, and she just, I, you know, I've never seen her again, but she popped up with a video. And she said in it, if God gave you a prophecy, don't you sit around and wonder if it's going to happen. If God said it, it's going to happen. It doesn't matter how old you are or how you can't see that it's going to come to pass. God will make it come to pass. No matter what you think, oh, there's not enough time. If he said it, he's going to do it. And that is being proven as we speak in my life. Here I am at 65 years old thinking, well, singing is over for me. No, no, it's not. I think it might just be beginning, okay? So let's go here with um, 1 Timothy 2. I urge then, first of all, that petitions, prayers, inter intercession, and thanksgiving be made for all people. So he's tasking Timothy with this practice. For kings and all those in authority, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. Remember, holiness means separated unto God, okay? You're God's. So he's telling us here, it's good to pray for the kings and the governors and the people over you, okay? So pray for our administration, which is Biden and Harris, uh, that administration definitely needs prayer, okay? We all know that. The ratings are low, let's pray, okay? And even if we don't like them, let's pray that the administration proves uh, something good at some point, okay? There's nothing wrong with that, and Paul is telling us we should be doing stuff like that. This is good and pleases God, our Savior, who wants all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. So we could pray that Biden and Harris become Christians, that the glorious light of the gospel shines in their hearts. For there is one God and one mediator between God and mankind, the man, Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all people. This has now been witnessed to at the proper time. And for this purpose, I was appointed a herald and an apostle. I'm telling the truth, I'm not lying, and a true and faithful teacher of the Gentiles. Now he's gone and planted these Gentile churches, which the Jewish apostles were not called to do, okay? They were planting the Jewish churches. So Paul is finishing up the rest of the world, okay? 
Therefore, I want the men everywhere to pray, lifting up holy hands without anger or disputing. I also want the women to dress modestly with decency and propriety, adorning themselves not with elaborate hairstyles. And we've seen crazy hairstyles, okay? So we can, we can imagine, all right? Now they may not have had, then again, nothing is new under the sun. They might have had the same crazy hairstyles we have today. But he's saying, you know, tone it down when you're worshiping. You know, you don't need to look a certain, you don't need to look crazy. You know, stay modest. Um, adorning themselves not with elaborate hairstyles or gold or pearls or expensive clothes, but with good deeds appropriate for women who profess to worship God. Now, this doesn't mean that we're slaves and have to look like Pollyanna if we're women. We don't have to wear dresses down to our ankles. That's not what he's saying. What I feel like when I go to church is I dress, if I want to dress up, unless it's a holiday and I want to wear a nice dress, um, if I want to dress up for a particular situation, I might dress up somewhat business-like, but with a little bit of a different casual flair, okay? Normally, I don't dress up at all for church, but I'm modest, okay? I don't come in. Now, I have seen young Christians and those that aren't Christians, God bless them, they come to church in skin-tight sheath dresses that are see-through and six-inch heels and, you know, their mini skirts. And, and see, this is what Paul's talking about. Now, some of this is cultural to his time, but there's something that we can pull out of it too. Just don't get too crazy. And remember that real Christian men are in there controlling their bodies and they don't need the extra temptation if their wife is with them. They don't need, to, you know, men are very visual. Not saying that women can't be that way, but men are very visual and there's no reason for us to be causing men in the church to stumble, okay? And if they're single men, even more of a reason to probably just dress very much like a lady, okay? Not crazy, all right? A woman, now I spent years going into church in a black leather motorcycle jacket. And at the time in the 80s, that was okay because Christian metal was starting to come out. But in the same token, I didn't wear, you know, mini skirts or, you know, I was careful. I usually just wore jeans or whatever. You know, I was just careful, okay? Because I know the struggle in, when I was younger to stay abstinent sexually and control my body. So I can imagine, I know that struggle and I don't want to do that to anyone else, okay? All right. Uh, a woman, so let's read it again. Therefore, I want the men everywhere to pray, lifting up holy hands without anger or disputing. I also want the women to dress modestly uh, with decency and propriety, adorning themselves not with elaborate hairstyles or gold or pearls or expensive clothes. It's not necessary, guys. And it, it does something to interrupt what the focus is at the church, which is just worshiping the Lord Jesus and honoring him. Uh, but with good deeds, appropriate for men who profess to worship God. Uh, uh, excuse me, appropriate for women who profess to worship God. A woman should learn in quietness and full submission. Now, this also, is, this is very much cultural. This is what I've been taught, that this is cultural. But let's read the whole thing so we can see if we can pull something out of it that we can use. A woman should learn in quietness and full submission. I don't permit a woman to teach or to assume authority over a man. She must be quiet. For Adam was formed first, then Eve. And Adam was not the one deceived. It was the woman who was deceived and became a sinner. Ooh, ow. But women will be saved through childbearing if they continue in faith, love, and holiness with propriety. We're going to pull that apart with Pastor Guzik. Okay. Uh, let's go here. First Timothy 2, uh, Enduring Word. And this is Pastor Guzik's commentary on the Bible. And he does this chapter by chapter. So let's see how he pulls this apart. Okay, because I'm not sure what we can pull out of that. That's very intense. All right, here we go. Let a, okay, I'm going to read what he has as the scripture. Let a woman learn in silence with all submission. I don't permit a woman to teach or have authority over a man, but to be in silence. All right, so he says here, let a woman learn in silence. The, this unfortunate translation has led some to believe that it's forbidden for women to even speak in church meetings. 
Paul uses the same word translated silence in 1 Timothy 2, verse 2, and it is translated peaceable there. The idea is without contention instead of total silence. Now, I would never have known to teach that to you, so we're learning here together. In other places in the New Testament, even in the writings of Paul, so let me just expound on that in one small way. Okay, in other words, if a man is in a church meeting and you're there with him and or it's a church service and he says something, you don't jump up and contradict him. You just keep it peaceable. Okay, you can talk to him later. All right. In other places in the New Testament, even in the writings of Paul, women are specifically mentioned as praying and speaking in the church. And that's true. And women as prophetesses. We've heard about women prophets all the way from the Old Testament. To learn in silence has the idea of women receiving the teaching of the men God has chosen to lead in the church with submission instead of contention. In other words, be just the way a marriage is, everybody has their place. He's saying, you know, women get in your place. Now, it's funny. Now, place doesn't mean less than once again. This isn't about man being better than woman. It's just everybody has a part, okay? Now, with my children, I used to say to them often, find your place and get in it. Because when everybody's in their proper place, the thing functions, okay? I'm not telling them you're less than. I'm saying find your place as a child in this family and get in it, please. Everything's going haywire because you're out of place, okay? So to be out of place doesn't denote value of the thing that's out of place. It doesn't make it low value. It's very valuable, but it's out of place. Okay. So, uh, 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 so to learn in silence has the idea of women receiving the teaching of the men God has chosen to lead in the church with submission instead of contention. Submission is the principle to learn in silence describes the application of the principle. Okay. Uh, then he goes on to say, Paul, I don't permit a woman to teach or have authority over a man. It says Paul's meaning seems clear. Women are not to have the role of teaching authority in the church. To be under authority is the principle, not teaching is the application. Okay, let's pull that apart. Paul is saying that the church should not recognize women as those having authority in the church regarding matters of doctrine and scriptural interpretation. Not all speaking or teaching by a woman is necessarily a violation of God's order of authority in the church. Whatever speaking or teaching is done by a woman must be done in submission to the men God has appointed to lead the church. Uh, and then it says here, 1 Corinthians 11, 1 through 12 emphasizes the same principle. Women are to always act under authority in the congregation demonstrated in Corinthian culture by the wearing of a head covering. And we remember, we looked at that. Therefore, a woman in the Corinthian church could only pray or prophesy if she demonstrated that she was under the leadership of the church. And she demonstrated this by wearing a head covering and by acting consistently with that principle. And then here it says, I do not permit as part of the scripture. Now he's going to pull that apart. The strength of Paul's wording here makes it challenging to obey this command in today's society. Since the 1970s, our culture has rejected the idea that there may be different roles for men and women in the home. So it's tougher now, okay, to say that's your lane, this is my lane. And this is where we've got all this confusion within marriages and the battle of the sexes is because nobody knows their role anymore in making something work, okay? It has nothing to do with the value of the human being in the role. It's just the roles, okay? Uh, and it goes on and talks about, uh, you know, prof the professional world, et cetera. Let's get back to the... Um, Oh, no, I want to look at this here. It says, but she will be saved through childbearing. Let's see what he says there. All right. Okay, nevertheless, she will be saved in childbearing. Many people regard this as one of the most difficult passages in the whole Bible. On the surface, it could be taken to mean that if a woman continues in faith, love, and holiness with self-control, 
that God will bless her with survival in childbirth because in those days, childbirth was terribly dangerous. It still is, but which was no small promise in the ancient world. Yet this interpretation leaves many difficult questions. Is this an absolute promise? What about godly women who've died in childbirth? In other words, it opens up a lot of cans of worms. What about sinful women who've survived childbirth? Blah, blah, blah. Okay. Um, some approach this passage saying saved refers to gaining eternal life. Yet this interpretation is even more difficult. Are women saved eternally by giving birth to children? Okay, on and on. Are they doing blah, blah. Uh, she will be saved in childbearing. Some say that Paul has mostly in mind that childbearing, not public teaching, is the peculiar function of woman with a glory and dignity all its own. I remember hearing that before, and I remember liking that. That it was saying, you know, because I'm telling you, men are never going to give birth. They're never going to know what that is to have a baby put on your breast. It's a stunning feeling. And the first thing I thought when it happened was God gave this deep gift to women. I felt like a queen. And I knew that God was saying, you are a queen, not me specifically, but woman. It was a deep gift to the woman that we should know something like that. So I received the interpretation that Paul is just giving a nod to the fact that, you know, men teach women get to bear the children. Okay, once again, a function of the role, not a demeaning opinion or statement about the value of the vessel, the person, not at all, okay? All right, so let's go to, and that's as deep as I can take you, okay? Because I don't know much about this, and it sounds like David Guzik also has wrestled with it. So there are some things in the Bible we wrestle with, and I'm learning right along with you, okay? All right, uh, chapter three. Here is a trustworthy saying. Whoever aspires to be an overseer desires, desires a noble task. Now, the overseer is to be above reproach, faithful to his wife, temperate, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not given to drunkenness, not violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. Now, in other versions, it says anyone who wants to be a deacon or who wants to be an elder, okay? He must manage his own family well and see that his children obey him, and he must do so in a manner worthy of full respect. So beating your children in front of everybody in the church is not disciplining or managing your children in a way that's worthy of respect, okay? You want to make sure you're doing everything with temperance and wisdom, et cetera, et cetera. All right. Uh, if anyone does not know how to manage his own family, how can he take care of God's church? He must not be a recent convert or he may become conceited and fall under the same judgment as the devil. Because that's why the devil got judged, because he was so proud. He said, I want to be God. He must also have a good reputation with outsiders so that he will not fall into disgrace and into the devil's trap. So if you remember in the Old Testament in Ezekiel and in Isaiah, the devil was described as saying, I will ascend to the holy mountain. I will sit on the throne. He wanted to be God and he was speaking it out. Okay. And he was thrown down to earth. And the Lord said, there isn't, you're going to be thrown out like a dead body with no one to bury you. Very sick. Sad. In the same way, deacons are to be worthy of respect sincere, not indulging in much wine, and not pursuing dishonest gain. Okay, so the first they said was an overseer, now it's going to deacons. Okay, I didn't remember that there was an overseer part. Um, I think it was elders, honestly. I think in another version it's if you want to be an elder, now it's if you want to be a deacon, are to be worthy of respect, sincere, not indulging in much wine, and not pursuing dishonest gain. They must keep hold of the deep truths of the faith and with a clear, with a clear conscience. They must first be tested, and then if there's nothing against them, let them serve as deacons. In the same way, the women are to be worthy of respect, not malicious talkers, but temperate and trustworthy in everything. It's very rare to see men be malicious talkers. I've met a few, but they're rare. And to be honest with you, they remind me of malicious women. 
Um, to me, in my life, and I'm not saying this against women, but we are a different creation, like different breeds of an animal, okay? Same animal, different breeds. I've met a lot of women that are very malicious talkers, gossips, backstabbers. I rarely, honest to God, in 65 years, I've probably seen two men that had vicious mouths, maybe three, and I can think of exactly who they are right now even though i don't know either of them i can think of the first two right away and they were horrifying i mean it's horrible to hear men being malicious and gossips okay it seems to be much more particular to women and this is why paul who obviously has seen this is saying um right here in uh, 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 11, in the same way the women are to be worthy of respect, not malicious talkers, but temperate and trustworthy in everything. That's a good admonition, okay? A deacon must be faithful to his wife and manage his children and his household well. Those who've served well gain an excellent standing and great assurance in their faith in Jesus Christ, in Christ Jesus. Although I hope to come to you soon, I'm writing you these instructions so that if I'm delayed, you will know how people ought to conduct themselves in God's household, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and foundation of the truth. Beyond all question, the mystery from which, from which true godliness springs is great. Okay, let me read that again because I read it strange, strangely. If I'm delayed, you'll know how people ought to conduct themselves in God's household, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and foundation of the truth. Beyond all question, the mystery from which true godliness springs is great. He appeared in the flesh, was vindicated by the spirit, was seen by angels, was preached among the nations, was believed on in the world, was taken up in glory. Okay. Uh, we're going to do one more chapter here. There are six in this book and four in the next. So we'll do uh, chapter four because it's very short. The Spirit clearly says that in later times, some will abandon the faith and follow deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. Such teachings come through hypocritical liars whose consciences have been seared as with a hot iron. They forbid people to marry and order them to abstain from certain foods, which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and who know the truth. In other words, eat what you want, be thankful for it. For everything God created is good, and nothing is to be rejected if it's received with thanksgiving, because it's consecrated by the word of God in prayer. If you point these things out to the brothers and sisters, you'll be a good minister of Christ Jesus, nourished on the truths of the faith and of the good teaching that you've followed. Have nothing to do with godless myths and old wives' tales. Rather, train yourself to be godly. And therein lies the rub. Train yourself for heaven, people. For physical training is of some value, but godliness has value for all things, including physical training. Godliness has value for all things, holding promise for both the present life and the life to come. This is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. This is, that is why we labor and strive, because we've put our hope in the living God, who is the Savior of all people, and especially of those who believe. Command and teach these things. Don't let anyone look down on you because you're young. Remember, this is a letter to Timothy, who's very young, probably about 18 right now. In this at the time of this letter but set an example for the believers in speech and conduct in love in faith and in purity until i come devote yourself to the public reading of scripture to preaching and to teaching do not neglect your gift which was given you through prophecy when the body of elders laid their hands on you you can give the gifts that you have to someone else by laying your hands on them. I mean, I've been in groups where we've laid hands and we've bestowed a certain gift. One woman, we gave her a gift and she's been prophesying ever since. It's really amazing, but you can transfer them. Um, uh, do not neglect your gift, which was given you through prophecy when the body of elders laid their hands on you. And he doesn't state what it is. 
but it's something. Be diligent in these matters. Give yourselves wholly to them so that everyone may see your progress. Watch your life and doctrine closely. Persevere in them because if you do, you will save both yourself and your hearers. In other words, be a good example because people are watching closely. And as you're a good example, they'll believe and you'll save them too. Okay, now, um, just one more thing because we're going to wrap it up now. It's 30 minutes. Uh, one more thing, some of what Paul speaks of is cultural. Some of it is what he's telling them to do. And we have this battle of the sexes. And I, because it's not about man being better than woman, woman being better than man, although we do have to remember the woman is the one who sinned first, became a sinner before the man did. And then on top of it, she enticed the man, which is really bad. All right. Um... You know, in today's world, women think that men are saying, or women think that consensus is that, oh, we're less than you because our job is just having babies. As if having babies is like a nothing job. Okay, so once again, it's not the, the jobs that are that are the roles that the sexes have have nothing to do with the value of the vessel, the human being. I want to repeat that. OK, but in today's world, it's gotten so twisted that they are say that feminists are saying our role makes us, you know, you're treating us like we're less than you because, you know, we don't want to have babies. We don't want to bake cookies. We don't want to run a house. OK, well, that's your personal problem. OK, I'm not saying every woman has to want to do that. Clearly, God's created us all differently. And there's women that are doing all kinds of jobs and are capable of it, just like men. But it's that disrespect of the basic, you know, keeping the house together, bearing the children, it's, and honoring, respecting your husband. It's the hatred for that traditional role that has caused so many problems because, and it's not just women, okay? There's also men turning around and pointing at women and saying, well, you're this and you're that, okay? So we've got a really big problem here. I think what I'm trying to say is, it's hatred of the roles. It's not, it's become somehow in their hatred of the role, it's come down to a value of the human being thing, which it should never have been. There's just different lanes and different tasks. Okay, and then we wonder why families can't stick together because everybody's out of their lane. We're all over the freeway careening, okay? Now, as far as women speaking and teaching in the church, we do have that, okay? Uh, you know, it is a more modern world than in Paul's day, okay? But the woman has to be some kind of an example to do it, okay? Um, in terms of my teaching, you guys, I feel that you do have a good example in me, okay? I can self-examine, and I'm not out there drinking and drugging. Um, I am sexually moral. Uh, you know, you've got something here that you can look to as an example. You, you don't have some person who's just trying to vaunt themselves in the church. Well, clearly I'm not even in a church setting, so I'm just doing this privately and personally with you guys. So, you know, obviously women can teach. We remember even from the Old Testament, there were prof prophetesses. Um, so, you know, once again, it's not about value of the vessel. All the vessels are equally valuable. You know, some, some men are teachers, some women are teachers, men are prophets, women are prophets, but only women can bear children. That's a special, special gift. I, t I attest to it. I testify. And I know my women friends can, will testify the same thing. I love you very much. I'll see you tomorrow. We'll pick it up and finish this book and go into the second book of Timothy, which is quite interesting. It's going to really describe the times we're living in today. I love you and I'll see you tomorrow. Good night.